so much to get into. We've, we've got about 15 minutes, and I really want you to, to get involved with this because I think we'll start off with something they've all talked about a lot, the supply chain and confidence and delivery and all of that. Trisha talked about a, a buzz, a positive buzz, everyone working together. But of course, it doesn't always work well. We've had a, a CBI ACOM survey fairly recently, and it, it suggests that the bulk of sort of infrastructure providers are not confident that things are going to be delivered on time. Highways England's going to deliver RIS-1. We've all got experience of the railways here, and we know what's happened with that, with electrification, all those projects slipping and, and money going and so on. Well, Jim, I'll, I'll turn to you first of all. Do, do you think there is still an issue for you trying to gain people's confidence, particularly supply chain confidence, that you're on it, that it's going to be finished on time, that it's going to be finished on budget, and that projects won't slip? Um, I think there is. I, I mean, 18 months into this, um, we've got 18 months behind us. A year ago, this was a tougher sell because we had three months behind us. Yeah. So 18 months in, you know, we've seen a change chancellor, we've seen Brexit, um, we've seen an, a comprehensive spending review, um, and despite all of these events, we still remain on track to deliver that work. I think the next level down, um, where we still have work to do, but we've started, is bringing stability to the supply chain. So we can't do three years of smart motorways programs with all of the technology and all that that involves, then stop for three years and go back to building flyovers and conventional roads, then stop for three years. We have to try and keep the supply chain, all of the supply chain busy all of the time. And therefore having a smart motorways program that stretches six or eight years into the future, new road building, renewals, et cetera, et cetera, to have those programs stable is, is my current target. Tricia, how much work does the government put into who's out there able to provide this work? Because there's, there's so much coming along, there's Heathrow potentially and all the railways and so on. Do you know there are enough companies out there with the right number of people to actually do what you want to do? Because it's very easy to say we want yeah. to build all these things and someone's got to do it. I, I completely agree. I think this is what par part of the integration challenge that I kind of posed uh, to the audience, and now you've sensibly posed it back at me. I mean, we do have, and um, we are working much, much harder cross-modally in the department to make sure that we've got a joined-up view of um, how the supply chain, how do we look to the supply chain uh, when we bring together what we're trying to do on roads and on rail and on high-speed rail. Uh, and the very big focus that we're putting on skills and workforce issues right now uh, is part of our response to that, because I think we recognize that, you know, looking ahead to the mid-2020s and beyond, uh, I think there is a job to be done to make sure that we're collectively in in good shape to meet those challenges. Is there anybody in the audience who'd like to put in a question on this point? It's at the back there, yeah, there should be a microphone coming to you. Uh, David Heitch. I'm interested uh, if we pick up the theme of futures, um, whether or not the panel believe that the current model for paying for our roads infrastructure is sustainable into the future. Hey, Steve, do you want to take that one on? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> it, it actually quick? isn't. I know it's a very serious proposition. Um, I think, you know, everybody knows uh, these days the move towards hybrids and um, all electrics, EVs, um, is draining revenue that the government has relied on for decades um, to not just pay for road infrastructure, but actually to pay for schools and hospitals. Um, so your revenue stream itself is disappearing. And that should tell you that you need to change the model. I think it means that the future will be road user charging, probably universal all roads, road user charging, something that in Eddington, for example, when uh, Rod Eddington reported was technically very difficult to install, had a huge price tag on it, something I think there's a figure buried in there of nearly 20 billion, uh, which would have, you know, in a sense mitigated any of the advantages of change. That's now a massively reduced figure. I think that's where the future will be, David. I don't see that the current system of relying on fuel duty, which is effectively what we do to pay for our roads, is going to be sustainable. Of course, if you do move to road user charging, you open up the prospect of genuine external investment into roads, something that I know the government is very keen to encourage, because you've then got a very straightforward model uh, which allows risk into the equation. Um, I heard the leader of Birmingham City Council talking earlier about his concerns about making sure the M6 toll, for example, extracted better value, not just for its operator, but in terms of decongesting roads around this city. Um, road user charging can achieve that in a way that fuel duty simply doesn't. I mean, Anthony, you must do a lot on... It's all about bringing the driver on... You can say that when you're not in government. <laughs> <laughs> if yes. a government minister was here, one of my successors was here, he'd say, no, 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 it's absolutely not on the agenda. So you can expect to hear that 
until somebody actually wakes up and smells the coffee. Do you think behind the scenes they are sitting there? Desperately? They've got to. Yes, they are. It's interesting, the Wolfson Prize this year, um, you know, Lord Wolfson has set this idea of giving a prize for the big ideas to solve the big issues in the country. Last year it was about how do we deal with expanding populations, do we create new towns or expand the ones we've got and so on. This year is about how do we pay for road infrastructure. Very clear uh, message, I think, that this is now a number one priority. We've got to tackle it. Uh, at last, we've got to get real. State of Oregon in the United States has done that, making huge progress on educating people about what's happening to fuel duty and how roads need to be financed. We've got to do the same job. Anthony, it's, presumably it's about persuading drivers, isn't it? Because if you're actually going to stop charging people to use the roads. People have talked about it for such a long time and then mm. huge petitions appear online and there, there are riots and everyone stops. Yes, it's, it's clearly a brave political decision to make, but it's going to have to come. You're going to have to ration the use of the road network in some way. And it's interesting at the moment because as a consumer organisation, we, we measure consumption and what people think about what they're consuming. And of course on the roads, that's quite an interesting issue because at the moment there's no payment at point of use. And so there's a sort of generalised feeling, well, it's all a bit of a problem, it's all everyone else's fault. But I think the gradual introduction of road pricing will bring more consumerism into it. Because if people are paying as they go, they'll want to get what they paid for or become very demanding. And there's a tiny little window of that. Those of you who've been hit by Uber's surge charge, that's a kind of mini road pricing in a way, because you know you're paying more in the peak and you make the choice about whether you want to pay it or not, or wait 20 minutes when the prices come down. The simplicity of that app. You can just imagine in 20 years' time you could press that and a car would be, an autonomous car would be summoned up to you. That's the way forward, surely. You pay for what you want to buy. Peter? Yeah, I, I won't comment on the merits of road user charging. Um, there are plenty of people on this panel much better qualified to talk about that than me. Uh, he says dodging it. But what I would say is that there is a huge um, uh, kind of wall of capital out there which would love to invest in uh, transport projects in the UK. Okay, my background is infrastructure finance, and I can tell you that there is more money than there are places to put that to work. If there were a model that could be made attractive to those investors, then it would certainly that you know there would be no shortage of interest in in finding the project. Does anyone else out there from the supply chain would like to make a point about whether you think RIS one is being well delivered, whether you're getting the information you need, uh, and so on? Get a microphone to you. Um, Chris Jackson from the Civil Engineering Contractors Association representing the, uh, the three northern regions uh, in relation to transport. Um, so I'm steering a little bit away from, from, from the point you want to make, Peter. I think um, the point that Stephen Norris made is, 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 is important that we recognise a lot of the big stuff and the ACOM CBI report confirmed that. Um, what we're really interested in in, uh, in the area that I'm focused on is the devolution agenda itself um, and how we can do more to maintain that momentum of devolution in order to be able to deliver some of the smaller schemes that have been talked about. How do we move the, the perception and the agenda away from the big stuff and start to get the local connectivity schemes, the local highway schemes, moving faster than they seem to be at the moment? Well, Jim, do you want to have a go at that? Because devolution's a funny one, isn't it? Because you, it's local people know what they want locally, but then you're obviously having to deal with projects that affect lots of people. You know, and I think uh, it's an important point. It's only our, two, our road network is only 2% of the roads. We have to reconcile those regional requirements with the national ones. Um, there's a very good example. We're sitting on it, the M42, um, M6. It, it, we refer to it as the Birmingham box. The vast majority of people who live here in Birmingham see that as their M25, and it's a way of getting backwards and forwards to work. If you're a freight haulier in the northwest or your Dover port, you see that as a, as a piece of national infrastructure. So we have to link that national need with that regional need um, to make sure that those schemes get delivered. I get a little nervous because sometimes we're seen in the same place as sort of network rail that, that everything we're doing is 200 million or this, that or the other. Actually, on our, on our roads, we're down to schemes that are as small as a million, two million, three million pounds, an awful lot of... Um, local improvements. We have a, a housing and growth fund that's 100 million, which we have used for, for different schemes on our roads. Uh, I had Derby Council in yesterday, um, talking about a major ambition for the south side of Derby Town and a new junction on the A50. 
So I think it's not about putting the regional first or putting the national first. It's about reconciling those two. Um, I think if you look at the Quornby report, there's a need for more funding. I see our roads, and I would say this, wouldn't I? But I see our roads as the sort of premiership and theirs as the championship. Guess what? There's a little bit of, of, of moving around at the, at the boundary. But generally speaking, the schemes we're proposing have better economics than the ones at the next level down, generally speaking. So the answer to that, quite frankly, is more money for those roads. And Tricia, we're going to be hearing a lot about the Cornby report. We've got a whole session on it. But do you think it might happen? If people don't know, this is a suggestion that effectively more of the local authority roads are brought in in the same funding gap, really, as, as all the trunk roads. So effectively, you're not separating off the trunk roads and the council roads, you're merging them more and, and co-funding them. Do you, do you think that's likely to happen? So I think I would distinguish between um, the the analytical proposition in this report, and I'm not surprised that we're going to be hearing about it all day because it is a really Im important um, uh, input into, into policy making. So there's the, the piece of analysis and then what we do with that piece of analysis. I think myself, um, the, there is a growing consensus that the kind of fundamental observation that there is not a cliff edge between the strategic road network and the local road network is spot on. So, um, and, and there's a definitely um, a set of roads which are performing a very, very different set of functions for, for sub-regional and regional economies. So I, I think the, in terms of the diagnostic, I think there's a growing consensus that it's really caught something which is worth doing something with. Um, in terms of what we then do um, with that, I think that's still very much um, in play. I think there are issues around the standards that we expect those roads to be designed to and maintained to, around the governance of those roads, around the funding of those roads. Um, and I think that's, that's a conversation that we'll be having with the highways community over the coming months. Okay, we're coming to our, our last couple of minutes. So I want to get on to RIS2 just very quickly. Uh, what, what has to happen in it? What's critical in RIS2 that isn't happening in RIS1? Uh, Anthony or Peter, do you want to take this one on? Well, I'll start, uh, and I'll steal some of Anthony's thunder. Uh, the user voice is absolutely critical. So we're co-sponsoring some work to look at uh, uh, user views on what should be in the next performance specification. Uh, and the lesson from other regulated sectors is that if you don't take the, uh, your customers, your users with you, uh, if you don't have legitimacy in their eyes, then you have a pretty tough job uh, when you want to spend their money. Uh, and so I think getting that right up front, and Jim has talked about the root strategies and uh, the company's engagement on those, I think it's critical that that underpins all the decisions that are made for the next period. Anthony, do you, do you think the user's going to have enough of a voice in, the, in RIS2? Yes. Yeah, I think the building blocks are being put into place, both in terms of the route strategies, both in terms of the national priorities, and hopefully you'll start to get some feed into the local priorities as well. And it all needs to fit together as a network, as Jim and others have said. So I think those building blocks are there. So I totally support what Peter said. The only thing I would add, I think it's very, very important that we also get an element of road and rail planning at the same time. It seems to be very elusive in this country that we can, do the, we can hold those two thoughts in our brain at the same time. But we've got to do it. There's some big decisions coming up about the rail network and about the road network, they've got to be complementary. Or, and you know how you cross the Pennines in the future and what the choices are that people are going to have, you've got to get some user input about what the, how they want to travel in the future and what the choices they'd like to have. Steve, can you see Network Rail Highways England as one, one big organisation one day? <laughs> is, is that the way to do it? Should one um, person do across everything? There's a terrific episode of Yes Minister when Jim Hacker says, why don't we have an integrated transport strategy? <laughs> it's a comedy. <laughs> actually, some of, us, some of us think that uh, Yes Minister is actually not a comedy at all. It's a tragic documentary. And uh, the reality is that um, much as it's desirable, it's eluded us for a very long time. It doesn't mean to say that we couldn't get planning better. I think, I think we generally can. I was just going to say one word on this issue of devolution. The last time I was in Birmingham, we were talking to the city leaders about what they would do when HS2 arrived. What, what were their plans? How were they going to optimize it? And one of the th questions we asked them was, um, do you think you've got enough money? And what was really interesting was that in Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, wherever we went, the civic leaders said, oh, yeah, we've got enough money. Uh, what we really need is the ability to spend it in the way that we know works best for our region. Because so much money arrives from central government. We're much worse than the Soviets in terms of central control of budgets. 
and it's all nicely penny packeted and it often is leading to counterintuitive conclusions. So devolution, I've seen it in London where it's worked terrifically over the last 16 years, I think is a really important part of the package of the future. Guys, thank you very much. A fascinating discussion. We could have gone on for far longer, frankly, but we've got to wind it up. So thank you all for coming. Thank you to my guests.